you is a great blessing. If he's not in prison, he is witnessing and ministering to homeless people everywhere and uh, everywhere he travels. That's, that's a tremendous blessing. I, I appreciate Brother Shu. He is a very enthusiastic uh, young man. He's fun to be around. Well, he's not so young. He's, anybody younger than I am is a young man, so he's, he's younger than I am. All right, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I don't know if I turned that on or not. I think I did. It is difficult to go through such a tremendous book of Scripture at such a fast pace, but we have tried to condense these six chapters into 12 lessons, and we will continue to try to stay on that pace tonight. That will require a brief explanation and resisting the temptation to stop and preach numerous times <laughs> along the way but nonetheless we will look at this passage of scripture and see what the Lord would have us to say from these verses let's pray together and we'll we'll just have to start without really going back and um, rehashing anything or giving any kind of in-depth uh, introduction if you've been keeping up with these uh, lessons in Galatians. This is lesson 10. And so we'll start in verse 10 in just a moment. Lord, we sure do love you. And we thank you for the privilege of being here this afternoon. It's a blessing to be in church. It's a blessing to be with God's people. It's a blessing to sing together. It's a blessing to pray together. It's a blessing to hear one another's burdens and their heartaches and their problems. And then their praise reports as well as we laugh together and cry together and worship and serve the Lord together. We're thankful for this opportunity. Lord, would you help me tonight as we uh, try to deliver a sermon from this passage of Scripture? Would you use us, Lord, to say those things uh, that you would have us to say? Would you help us to refrain from saying anything, Lord, that would be dishonoring or unpleasing to you? And uh, Lord, I sure need your help. And I do pray that you would help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse number 10, chapter 5, verse number 10. Paul said, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. Now, obviously, the last part of this verse is a warning. And if you know the Lord is your Savior, you've been walking with Christ, you, you should not have any desire to backslide. You shouldn't want to backslide. You shouldn't want to go back into the world. And even if you do, there, you, you shouldn't want to, but if you do, you certainly don't want to carry anyone with you. That seems to be the warning here. Uh, don't try to tear anybody else down, bring anybody else down, or certainly uh, try not to tear a church up. If you're going to ruin your own life, don't get involved in ruining somebody else's. The Lord doesn't take kindly to that. Now, if you claim to be a believer, but you're not faithful to church, and there seems to be a growing population of those kind of people in the day that we're living in, God's not going to look lightly on you being out in the world, living after the lust of the flesh, and running other Christians down that are faithful to church and trying to do something for the Lord. So there's two places, two places in the Bible come to mind where God promises judgment. Hold your place right here, we'll be right back. Come to Hebrews chapter 13 for just a moment. Hebrews chapter 13. You either know the scripture, know exactly where we're going. Hebrews chapter 13. I want to look at something here. Two places in the Bible come to mind when God, where God promises judgment. Look at verse number, for the sake of time, we'll just read the verse. Look at verse number four. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers, whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So whoremongers, the combining of two words, whore and monger, and of course a whore means to have unlawful sexual commerce. It means to practice lewdness. A monger is a traitor or a dealer, if you will. And so a whoremonger is one who is a traitor, dealer, sailor, or seller of sexual content or material. God will judge those who buy, sell, trade, watch, and look at pornography. I promise you it is wicked in the sight of God. 
The society that we live in makes a mockery of, mar of marriage and a mockery of marriage vows. But rest assured that God has not changed his mind about marriage. And those who uh, dishonor their marriage vows and participate or partake in adultery, the Bible is very clear about the fact that God will judge. The Bible doesn't say God may judge. It doesn't say that God could judge. It says God will judge judge. That's, that's a pretty serious, uh, serious ac um, accusation from the Bible. Now, uh, I'm appalled by a nation of people who believe that the Bible teaches that God loves everybody. I'm not appalled that they believe that. God does love everybody. But that same group of people will not believe that the same Bible and the same God says that he will judge those who live that kind of lifestyle. That's kind of a, a wicked thing. So, sir, ma'am, young ma'am, young lady, young man, young lady, uh, you need to keep your heart, your mind, and your life clear, plain, clean, amen, and pleasing to the Lord. Now, come back to Galatians chapter 5. So, messing with another man's wife or another man's husband is one of those where God promised judgment. The second one is messing with the bride of Christ. We just read that in our text verse in verse number 10. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. Now, I don't have time to go back to last week's message, last week's sermon, but we talked about a group of people who had came in and they began teaching the Galatians things that Paul did not teach them and were taking them away from the things of Christ. And so uh, when you mess up other believers and when you mess up the church of God, when you try to mess with God's bride, God is going to, God's going to take vengeance for that. He's going, to, he's going to do something about that. That's very clear in the scripture. Now, and now look what it says at the end of the verse. Whosoever he be. It doesn't matter who we are, amen. The Lord has made this a promise to us in the scripture. So if you want to jump ship, you better go and do it yourself. You, you start taking people with you and messing with God's church, the Lord's not going to take kindly to that. He's going to, he's going to, get, he's going to get you, amen. I like, how about that phrase? He's going to get you. Now, verse number 11, people don't like to hear that. Listen, our God is still a God of judgment and a God of wrath. I'm thankful that he's merciful and kind and loving. I'm, I'm as thankful for that as you are, maybe more so, because I know how bad I am. But that same God is still a God of vengeance and a God of wrath and a God of judgment, amen. And uh, he's, the Bible says he's a consuming fire. Now, that's, that's pretty rough. Now, look at verse number 11. I've got to move on. And I, brethren, if I preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Now, I tell you, New Testament Christianity offends everyone except for New Testament Christians. And so Paul, he is reasoning here uh, that if, his, if he was preaching circumcision, that's preaching the Jewish religion or ritual or ceremony, then he wouldn't be suffering persecution for preaching the gospel. And when we say, when we say that the only way to heaven is Jesus Christ and everybody that's trying to get there some other way is going to go to hell, they're not going to make it, that's offensive to people. And uh, so uh, those who believe in reincarnation, those who believe in karma, those who believe in good deeds and good works and water baptism and all, all of another thousand things you can think of, when you tell them that the only hope they have of eternal life is found in the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ made for their sins, that's offensive to them. They, they want to keep their Sabbath and do what they can do when Jesus Christ has done everything possible for them to be saved and it causes people to get all messed up, amen. They'll persecute you for that preaching. Now, you, now you, can, do this, you, can, ignore, you can ignore that persecution by ignoring, which is what a lot of saved people are doing uh, anymore. They're completely ignoring what God wants them to do. And they never share the gospel. They never witness with anyone. They never tell anybody about Jesus. And you can completely ignore persecution if you want to be a, a hideaway or a embarrassed or ashamed or, or whatever. I don't know what you want to call it. Believer, you can be that. But that's not what the Bible asks us to be. Amen. And so uh, the Bible has called us to tell people about Jesus. You, 
Paul could have Paul could have said, you know, I, I, Paul was trying to reason with him. I, I don't have to. I don't have to go to these towns. I, I don't have to get beat. I don't have to be in prison. I don't have to suffer this kind of persecution. I could. I could just preach what those men came here preaching, and that's circumcision. And I could avoid all of these trouble, all these problems that I've had. But that's not the gospel. That's not the message. That's not going to save people. That's not going to help people. And so when Paul told those people that their idols were wrong, that their temple was wasn't sufficient, that keeping the law wasn't going to help and their Jewish religion wasn't going to save them, he got in trouble for it. And you will too, amen. And so uh, I, just, just keep on preaching Jesus. He's the only hope for mankind. And I, I know sometimes we get a little weary with that. We get a little lackadaisical in it. But I want to tell you this. Aren't you glad somebody told you about Jesus? You, you could be hung up in some kind of religion. Uh, Brother TJ was reading that letter and talking about that guy in jail that was about to get mixed up in Islam, and he just knew something was wrong about it. He knew that because his mama had took him to church when he was a little boy, and he heard about Jesus. Aren't you glad somebody told you about Jesus? The Bible says that the fields are white already under harvest. You know what that means? It means there's people out there who are wanting somebody to tell them about Jesus. I believe that. Amen. And so uh, God help us to be willing to tell people about Jesus. Now, I'll give you two reasons. Two reasons why the cross is so offensive. It announces that anything man can do isn't enough. He needs what, cross di what Christ did on the cross. The second reason is it raises up Jesus Christ as being the perfect sinless substitute who died in our place. This fact is very offensive to other religions who believe there are alternative ways to heaven. I'm glad that Jesus Christ made it simple, and I'm glad he is the only way. Now, verse number 11, I'll read it again. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Verse number 12, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Now, the term cut off is found in the law, or found in the Old Testament, if you will, 186 times. But it's only found eight times in the New Testament. Now, I, let's come to Daniel chapter 9, if you will. It's a term to cut off is a term for public execution or for the public execution of criminals. You'll recognize this example. Is this example? Come to Daniel chapter nine, verse twenty-six. Daniel chapter nine, verse twenty-six. Look what it says. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Now that's that's pretty severe. That's pretty rough. This is a prophecy, obviously, concerning the death of Christ. And so we see that the, the term, we understand what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we know that he gave his life. And uh, uh, Daniel here prophesied the Messiah shall be cut off. And so although Paul, you can come back to Galatians. We know that Paul had no intent. He was not going to lift his hand against these individuals. He was not going to harm them in any way. Paul said here, but I'll tell you what he did say. He said, I wish God would cut them off. Is that what he said? He said, I would. They were even cut off, which trouble you. So Paul said here that he wished God would kill them or that God would cut them off. He's not going to lift his hand against them to trouble them. And you and I, there, there's no need for you and I to lift our hand against those that trouble us and against those that trouble our church. The Lord would take care of that. There's no need for us to worry about that at all. It'd be real easy for us to respond to a lot of garbage that's been put on social media about us. And it's been, it would be real easy for us to lash out to those who have lashed out against us and their, and their propaganda, whatever the case may be. But there's, there's no need for us to do any of that at all whatsoever. The Lord will take care of that. God will take care of that. There's no, there's no need for us to do that at all whatsoever. Now, I think this is really interesting. We are falsely told by a lot of these new translators of these new, well, they aren't translators, a lot of these new Bible versions that have put out all kinds of perversions of Bibles over the years. And um, we're falsely told by them that they have, the reason that they changed the Bible was to change some of the hard to understand words to easy to understand words. And so the NIV took this phrase cut off 
and changed it to emasculate. I don't miss it, cut off, emasculate. I, I, well, first of all, the two terms don't even mean the same thing at all. And certainly easier to understand cut off than it is emasculate. And emasculate means to castrate. Now, could you imagine, could you imagine the phrase, the, the verse that we read in Daniel 9, 26? I think they did a little more to the Lord Jesus Christ than down the cross. I think they put him to death. He gave his life on the cross for you and I. So here's, there's a very stern warning here in this verse of scripture in verse number 12. I would that they were even cut off which trouble you. And so there's some grave dangers in falling back into that old life of sin and taking others with you. Look at verse 13. For brethren, we have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now, we, we that are born again, we that are saved, we have trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have been set free. We've been set at liberty. Thank God for the freedom and the liberty that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that does not mean that we are free to do our own thing. That doesn't mean we're free to live our own way. That doesn't mean that we're free to pursue whatever kind of sin and wicked lifestyle and ungodliness that comes about. No, we... we the, just because we no longer have a fear of hell doesn't mean that we are free to live like it. Amen. And so I'm thankful that God has given us freedom. I'm glad that God has given us liberty. But it means that we have been set free so that unlike the days when we were lost and in bondage to sin, we didn't care for anybody but ourselves. We are now free to care about others. Amen. Now, the entirety, we're not going to go there for the sake of time. We've been there before. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and it might be, I can't remember for sure, there's also a passage in Romans, it might be chapter 14, is about our Christian liberty. And 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is talking about that, uh, you know, we're not it's talking about eating meat that's offered to idols, and, and those who are weak in the faith, they didn't, they didn't understand that, and so those of us who knew that we had that freedom, had that liberty in Christ, we, we knew there's nothing wrong with eating that, but the Bible gives us a warning about taking advantage of that liberty. It said in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 9, this is what the Bible said. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. And so we're not to use our freedom, we're not to use our liberty to cause others to stumble. We have been set free from self-interest. We should be. We should be self, set free from uh, self-love and self-centeredness. Amen. God set us free from a lot of things. And so uh, we, we've been set free to be a part of something far bigger than what we were associated with before. I had no idea what I was getting into when I got saved, but I sure am glad I got into it. Amen. And so we, we have this great liberty uh, we've been set free to enjoy the liberty of Jesus Christ. We've been set free uh, from everything having to be about me. I don't, some uh, Americans are selfish people, I guess, by nature. I don't know, or maybe because we have so much, we are inclined to be extremely selfish and self-interested and all that. But I'm, I'm glad we don't have to be. I'm glad I came to the place where life Cease to be all about me. I want to say this too. I don't have to, I want to. This freedom, this liberty, law is a I have to thing. Freedom and liberty is I want to. I, I want to be a blessing to others. I, I want to help others. I, I, I want to tell people about Jesus. I, I, I want to spend my life trying my best to do something for the benefit of others and for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have to. I want to. And so I've been, I've been set at liberty to do that. I, I want to participate. I want to bear others' burdens. I, I want to give a lost man the gospel. I want to help a saved man in his walk with God. I want to be a blessing to God's people. So may the Lord help us to do that. Now, those who are trying to follow all these, the circumcision is what they're talking about here in the Jewish religion and going back under the law and all that, they're putting themselves back under the bondage that they have escaped from 
And they don't, they don't have to do that. Amen. And so in here in this verse, Paul says that we have not been set free to serve our flesh, but we have been set free to serve one another and to love one another. Now, it says, For brethren, we have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Verse 14, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, we can make love complicated. There's a million different definitions that you could use for love, but we all know what love is. I want to tell you what it is, real simple. It's you treating people the way you want them to treat you. That's, that's a pretty easy way to explain what love is. To love is to sacrifice. To love is to give. To love is to minister to others. Now, listen to this. When Christ sets us free... It is no longer about how others ought to love me. It's how I can love and treat others. The test is, can we love those who do not deserve our love? Now, it's easy for me to love people who love me. I, I don't have any problem loving people who are good to me. But it is difficult to love people who have not been. It, it, it doesn't, this is the honest truth. It doesn't really even bother me. When people are not good to me, I, I somehow, the Lord really helps me. I, you know, just okay. <laughs> but I, I have a hard time when when people are not kind to my family, and I and I have a I have a hard time when people are not kind towards our church. Those are things that I love, and when people are not kind to them, then I have a little more a little more difficult time loving them. But. We, the test is, can we love those who do not deserve our love? May the Lord help us to love those. Now, look, come to Romans chapter 13 for just a moment. If you are in love, you will fulfill the commandments of Romans 13, verses 8 through 8 and 9 at least. Let's look what it says. Romans 13, look at verse number 8. Oh, no man, anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, it's not always easy, but the passage is very clear, it's very simple. If you love one another, you don't even need the law that says all of these commandments. You don't need the commandment that we're given for all these things. Because if you love a man, you don't steal from him. You don't kill him. You don't tell lies about him. You don't covet his stuff. You don't commit adultery with his wife. And so God help us to love one another. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. Now, look at the next verse. Come back to Galatians 5. Look at verse 15. But, but... If you bite and devour one another, well, it's obvious that you don't love each other. First of all, if you're biting and devouring each other, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. And so we have the, the passage to love one another, and if you don't love each, one, each other, there's going to be a lot of biting. There's going to be a lot of devouring one another. And the Bible says to take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Listen, lost people hurt each other. They, they, they snip at each other. They bite at each other. They injure each other. And uh, it is, it's just a mess what goes on out there. They don't, get, uh, they don't get treated the way that they feel like they should be treated or should have gotten treated. Then they lash out. But here in Galatians 5, Paul said that saved people were devouring other saved people. May the Lord help you and I who claim to be Christians, who claim to know the Lord as our Savior. May the Lord help us that when, then our, when our mouth is open, that we'd be really careful not to be, not to be negative, not to be critical, not to be hurting others, not to be defaming others. And I, I, certainly, I certainly hope that you don't have that kind of biting and devouring and bitterness towards your spouse and your children and that kind of things. But I'll tell you, our church world is in a mess. I, it's in a mess for a lot of reasons. I understand that. 
But, uh, you know, the lost world doesn't devour saved people. It's saved people that devour saved people. You know, it's not, it's not the lost world that destroys, that tears down and destroys churches. It's saved people that tear down and destroy churches. And, and it's a miserable mess. Now, listen, Christian friend, don't get caught up in destroying other believers. Don't get caught up in destroying churches because you and I have been set free from that. And besides all that, we get to the next chapter. In chapter 6, the Bible tells us that we're going to reap what we sow. And so may the Lord help you and I to understand that God expects us to love each other. And he didn't say love those that love you. And he didn't say love those that are kind to you. And he didn't say just love those who are good to you. No, we, the commandment is that we love people. That's really easy to say, but it's hard to live. And so in order to do that, we're going to have to have some humility. We're, we're going to have to have some kindness. We're, we're going to have to have some grace. We're, we're going to have to have the Lord to help us. Because in and of ourselves, we can't do that. But you're not in and of yourself. You have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and he can enable you to love those who are unlovable. And it, I tell you, if you don't, you're not hurting the other person. You're killing yourself. You're, you're devouring yourself. Bitterness is going to eat you up. Listen, you're, you're going to lose your joy. You're not going to have, any, you're not going to have any, any praise, any worship. You're not going to have any testimony for the Lord. You're, not going to, you're going to lose your desire to be faithful to the things of God. All because of bitterness in your heart towards other people. And it ain't hurting them at all. But it's eating you up. And that's, listen, I, I'm, I've, been, I've, been, I've been through this so many times in my own life, I know exactly how it affects you. Your Bible reading will get slack. Your prayer, lift, your prayer life will get very soft. You'll be very short with other people. You'll come to church because you have to. Not because you want to. You'll participate because you have to. Not because you want to. I'm still preaching. <laughs> A lot of people went to sleep right there. But I'm still preaching. And you've been set free from all of that. That's the liberty. That's the freedom. You placed yourself back under bondage. It became a I have to when it should be I get to, I want to. Now, please learn here from verse 15 that the one who is bitten is not the one that ends up consumed. It's the one who's doing the biting that winds up being consumed. You should decide now that you're not going to spend the rest of your life hanging around with people that bite, devour, ridicule, cut down, and find fault and badmouth others. Life's too short. I ain't got many days left. I'm not, there's, I'm, I'll tell you, I, I, I decided a couple weeks ago, there's some things that just ain't worth dying over. There's some things that just ain't worth fighting over. There's some things that just aren't worth arguing over. Now, and listen, I'm not talking about anything that we shouldn't be doing biblically. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm just talking about a lot of things that we get involved in that are meaningless. There ain't no use for it. There ain't no time for it. People are going to hell while we're arguing over stupid stuff. We have no victory. We have no joy. We have no compassion. We have no love. We, it, it is, it's ridiculous. You ought to get it right. You ought, you ought to get it right today. It's not, it's not fun to live like that. It's not fun for you. It's not fun for those around you. God is a God of grace. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of love. God is a God of compassion. He is a forgiving God. But he will not forgive you till you ask. Verse 16. This I say then. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See how that goes right along? You know what the flesh wants to do? It wants to bite. It wants to devour. It wants to ridicule. It wants to criticize. It wants to cut down. It wants to, it wants to retaliate. It wants to attack. That's the lust of the flesh. That's what, your, that's what your flesh loves to do. That's what my flesh loves to do. So I have a choice. I can place myself back under that bondage of that academic nature 
or I can exercise the freedom and the liberty that I have in Christ and say, I don't, I don't have to fool with that. The Lord will take care of all that. I'm just going to keep on living for him. I'm going to tell the next man about Jesus, and hopefully he'll get born again, and we'll just keep on serving the Lord. If you spend your time biting and devouring others, you're satisfying the lust of the flesh, and you're grieving the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. If you fulfill the lust of the flesh, in the short term, you're going to hurt people and you're going to hurt the church. But in the long term, listen, in the long term, you're hindering the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. It just ain't worth it. Amen. God help us to yield to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our life and not get caught up in satisfying the evil cravings of our rotten flesh. Verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. Now, we, we all have a choice. We can either satisfy the flesh, or we can satisfy the Holy Spirit. I mentioned just a moment ago, the flesh wants to attack, the flesh wants to retaliate, and the Holy Spirit says, no, I want you to love that man. No, I want you to have compassion on that man. No, I want you to have mercy on that lady. No, I, I want you to show kindness toward her. No, my flesh is not interested. Then don't please the flesh. Please the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. If you keep listening to those biters and devourers, they will destroy you to the point you'll be just like them. You become like those you hang around with and you become like those who you fellowship with. That's why I want to fellowship with people that loves God, loves the Bible, and loves the brethren and wants to be pleasing to the Lord. I need those examples in my life. I don't, I don't need examples where, of people who can't get along with themselves, much less anybody else. Now I, now, I have a hard time getting along with me, <laughs> but I don't, I, I don't have much trouble getting along with other people, I hope. But uh, I, I got a lot of problems, and so me and myself, we fight a lot. But um, I try to get along with other people as best I can. Now, how about instead of critiquing everybody, why don't you use your magnificence and your superiority to help others be as good as you are? That'd be a blessing. We're, we're so easy to be critical. We're so quick to criticize. And we never take inventory of the fact of all of our faults and all of our shortcomings. Listen, why, why are you not involved in, in helping others have a closer walk with the Lord? Why don't you help others be more effective in their Christian lives? If you choose to walk in the flesh instead of under the control of the Holy Spirit, my life or your life, as far as the physical realm is concerned, will be no different than it was before I was saved. I'll tell you, your flesh is not saved. It's as wicked as it's ever been. We'll, we'll read here in just a moment. It is apt to do absolutely everything it has done in the past or even worse if you follow the lust of that flesh. Now, let me get verse 18. Well, let me read verse 17 again. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. I, I mentioned this earlier. I want to mention it again along this line. Allowing the Holy Spirit to lead my life is evidence that I want to. But when I'm led by the law, it's evident that I have to. If your attitude is, I have to pray, I have to read my Bible, I have to go to church, I have to witness, I have to give, you're not free. You're not under liberty. You're under law. Hello? <laughs> ain't, ain't that the truth? Hey, I, I've been there time after time after time after time after time. But man, when you get that heart right with the Lord, you can't wait to get back to church. You can't wait to tell somebody else about Jesus. You want to go help somebody. You want to be a blessing to somebody else. You, and and it's, not, it's, not even, it's not difficult at all. You know why? Because you got your want to back. 
You got your liberty back. You got your freedom back. Hmm. <clears throat> I'm trying to decide if I want to say anything else there or not. <laughs> look, look what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4. Let me, let, me, let me say this. If there was a time when you once rejoiced at bringing people to Jesus, and now you're rejoicing at pulling people away from Jesus, you're in a mess. You're in a mess. 1 Peter chapter 4 says this in verse number 8. Let's read this part of the verse. Fervent charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Listen, when you fall out of love, the sins of others tend to be magnified instead of covered. Fervent charity shall cover the multitude of sins. May the Lord help us to walk in the Spirit and love one another. Because I'm going to tell you, you may can't see them in your life, but your life is full of failures and shortcomings and, and sins, and you need people to have fervent charity with you. And you know what they need? They need you to have fervent charity with them. Amen. Verse number 19. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest. They're made clear. They're made known. They're made evident. They're seen. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murderers, drunkenness, revelous, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we have just read a list, I think there's 17, we have just read seven, if I remember correctly, this, this long list of sins that anyone saved or lost is capable of doing if you're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. And I, I know we have all kinds of, of people, no, no, if you're saved, you, no, you, you didn't read the same Bible that I read. We're talking to Christian people. Talk, Paul is talking to the churches in Galatia. And he says, I, I'm going to tell you, he said, now the works of the flesh are manifest. Why would he write that to believers if it were not possible for the believers who get, get to walking in the flesh instead of walking in the spirit are not capable of such wickedness? Now, even if you don't know the meaning of all of these words, just read them, you've got a pretty idea that they're all bad things. And because of our, our lost idemic nature, every one of us is capable of performing all of the misdeeds in this list. The reason that nobody has to teach you how to do the things in this list is because the author of your idemic flesh, Adam, amen, is, is still present with you. You, you still have that old man. That body has not be, yet been redeemed. That body has not yet been adopted. We, Romans chapter 8 teaches us that. And so this flesh is just as lost as it's ever been. And we are in great need of the help of the Lord. So if the flesh is given the reign of your life, you will produce the things mentioned in these verses. On the other hand, if you're walking in the spirit, there's a list of things we'll read in a minute in verses 22 and 23 that will be evident in your life. And so I, I don't know about you, but I'd much rather have, have joy and peace and long-suffering, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance than I had this ugly list of things going on in my life. What I mean, my goodness, who, who would want to live this life when you could be living that life? The only reason you're living this life is because you want to please the flesh. When you could be walking in the Spirit and enjoying these great things that are manifest by the fruit of the Spirit. It's not even, I don't, I don't know why there would even be a, <laughs> it's, it's a no-brainer as the old saying goes. So God help us, amen, to walk after the flesh and not after the spirit. When you got saved, nothing happened to your flesh. Your flesh is still waiting in adoption. Nothing happened to your personality. Nothing happened to your old thoughts. Nothing happened to those old desires and nothing happened to those old appetites. And so we're capable of doing anything in that list if we're walking in the flesh and on the spirit. Now, 
If you're governed by your flesh, your flesh will produce what it always produced, which is the works of the flesh. Now we'll go, we'll quickly, quickly, I'll, I'll give you, well, let, let me, let me, I don't know. There's, there's so much to talk about in so little time. There's a, um, I could go back and, and do some stuff in this chapter later, and I might do that. Your flesh has not ceased to be what it always was, even though you've now added the Holy Spirit or the new birth to your life. You, you, we have the Spirit of God living within us. We have the ability through the help of the Lord to live above the lust and the desires of the flesh. Thank God for that. Now, there's two reasons, two reasons why it's important that we know that a believer is capable of falling back into this list of sins. First of all, first of all, there are some people that haven't been saved long and they are, they are still doing something terrible. Now, when that happens, or a lot of times, as I'll tell you, a lot of times people have been saved for a long time. And because they have refused to study themselves and because they've refused to learn or because they've refused to be uh, faithful to hear preaching and hear teaching uh, from the Bible, they're, they're as much of... Uh, Listen, I, I'm not going to name names and don't ask me to. I never would. I know some people that I believe are saved, and they've been, they've been saved probably 20 years, and they're as much a babe as somebody that got saved last week. You know why? They have never. Uh, look, you say, who's to blame for that? Their church? The church will answer for what they are guilty of, but no. God placed the Holy Spirit within you. When you got saved, there will be some, the Bible talks about in, in 1 Peter about being born again. And this, they desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow by, by, thereby. When you first get saved, there's going to be a desire in your heart to know something about this book. I'm, I'm to, and if you, if, you, if you follow that desire, God will put you in a place where you can learn what he wants you to learn. Amen. Now, and, and the Bible also says the study to show thyself approved. I, you know, I, 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 listen, I understand. There's times people, they, they, didn't have a, they don't have a Christian background. They didn't grow up in a Christian home, a Christian family. They have no direction from their family. They've they been lost their whole life. They get saved when they're 30 or 40 years old. They've never been to church. I, I understand that. But still, but still, you can't count out the Holy Spirit that lives in that life. I, I know one man in particular. He was a he was a cocaine addict, and he was a drunk. And in fact, the night he got saved, he he I heard him tell this testimony many times. I know the man very well personally, so I know he's telling the truth. He sat in the parking lot and drank beer until he got enough courage to go in the church. And he got saved. And this was a man that was highly addicted to cocaine and alcohol and it was an immediate he, he never went to a, an AA class he never went to a reformers whatever they are he never had any withdrawals you know what happened God that's what happened God happened the Lord the Holy Spirit will do a work in your life so sure, there's people that are going to have to give an account for some things. But the thing about it is, God puts a Holy Spirit within you. And that Holy Spirit will teach you. Know, the, the day that my wife got saved, it was a Sunday morning. And uh, I, I had been so far backslidden, I was worse than a lost man. You say, I don't believe that. Well, I, I'll read you that Bible verse sometimes. It's in the Bible. I was a mess. And my wife got saved on that Sunday morning on January the 21st. And God did something in my heart. He started doing something in my heart long before we ever got to that church. And, and I got things right with God. And we went home that Sunday. Both of us wanted to go back to church Sunday night. But I didn't want to ask her. And she didn't want to ask me. And so you know what we tried to do? We tried to watch TV. We couldn't. Now, I, I don't care where you go with that or how you, how you think about it. I turned this show on, and I said, well, we can't watch that. <laughs> and we flipped the channel, and how we said, well, we can't watch that. And we flipped the channel, and, well, well we, we can't watch that. What happened? 
He happened. Something in my heart, something in her heart that was not present and was not active before, but now was, and her eyes was open. So I, I understand that people, I get back to where I was at, two reasons why this is so important. There are some people who haven't been saved a long time and they're still doing something terrible. And when that happens, people will inevitably say, somebody will, oh, they must have not really gotten saved because if they'd have got, really gotten saved, they wouldn't be doing that. <laughs> the answer to that is right here, right here. We just read it, that any person can do, any saved person can do anything in this list in verses 19 to 21 that a lost man can do if their flesh is what's running them. That's sad. But I want to tell you something. I've already mentioned, I don't know why in the world anybody would want to trade that list for the list they could have. But some people do. And as horrible as that is, I am thankful that this is in the Bible. You know why? It tells me two things. How horrible man is and how wonderful our Savior is and how great his salvation is. Is that a blessing? Now, number two, there are some people who have been saved for many years who say, oh, I would never do anything like that again because I know better. Please, don't ever make a statement so foolish. Don't ever say something so dumb. I heard a man stand up and testify in church one time. A man I love. He made a statement during that testimony about his kids would never do that. But they did. By God's grace, I don't want to do that. By God's grace, I don't want to do that. By God's grace, I don't want my children. By God's grace, I don't want any of you. But to stand and say that I, boy, I'm, be, I've outgrown all of that. Man, you'll never get. You, you don't know what's going to happen to you next week. You better be careful. Amen. Uh, you listen. Let me tell you how fast you can flip those two extremes. You can be riding down the road listening to a good CD with good gospel music and you can be patting your foot, slapping your leg, singing along, praising the Lord and somebody cuts you off in traffic and you'll be cursing under your breath. That fast. You know why? Your flesh is wicked. God help us. Have you ever been, you've ever been reading your Bible and, and all of a sudden, you remember you haven't, you haven't paid any attention to what you've read for the last seven or eight verses. And the reason you haven't is because somebody you haven't alt with is on your mind and you can't get it off. You ever been praying and you're down on your knees and, you, and you've been praying for a while and you realize that I've spent more time daydreaming and more time sleeping than I've been praying? You know why that is? Because your flesh is rotten. God help us not to get bitter, get angry. Doesn't do anything but destroy relationships, ruins families, ruins churches, destroys lives, breaks hearts, causes misery, destruction, embarrassment. When we could have love, we could have joy, we could have peace. We could have long suffering, mercy, gentleness, kindness. But because I'd rather please my stinking rotten flesh than to enjoy the freedom and the liberty that I have to serve Christ and man. Let me give you a brief explanation of each of these 17 works of the flesh. I don't have time. I'll, I'll do that. I'll just come back. I'm going to come back and just preach from Galatians chapter 5 really soon. Verse number 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Is that a blessing? God help us to 
live after the flesh and not walk after, or live after the spirit and not walk after the flesh. Verse 24 says, and they that have Christ, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying each other. The decision is ours. The choice is yours. You can obey whichever one you want to. You can live after whichever one you want to. You can be as miserable as you want to be or you can be as happy as you want to be. You can be as in bondage as you want to be or you can be as free as you want to be. You can be the kind of person that people says, oh, sure it's good to see you. Or you can be the person that everybody turns the corner and goes the other way when they see you coming. The choice is yours. But I want to tell you something. If you choose to be that individual that nobody wants to see and everybody's running from, there's going to come a day in your life when you're going to need the same mercy and you're going to need the same grace and you're going to see the same charity that you would not express towards someone else and you're not going to get it. You know why? Because you reap what you sow. I want to be good to people because God's good to me. And I want to be good to people because I want people to be good to me. I want to forgive people because I need God's forgiveness. And I want to forgive people because I need people's forgiveness. I, I don't want to go home and board myself up, be a hermit, die alone without anybody to care or anybody to love. It's a horrible life. Amen. Father, thank you for the Bible. Lord, help me. God, help us all. Help us, Lord, to be pleasing to you. Lord, you've set us free. You've given us liberty. You've given us the Spirit of God to reside in our heart. Help us to live after the Spirit and not to walk after the flesh. Lord, it, before we get home, I, before I get out of this building, I'll be attacked some way, somehow. Before I get home, God help me, help me not to fall prey to the lust of the flesh, but to continue in the spirit. I need your help, Lord. Our church needs your help. Our people need your help. This world is hurting. The church world is hurting. God, we need each other more than we've ever needed each other. Help us to exercise the freedom that you've given us in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.